All right, I am going to continue here with Deleuze History and Science by Manuel de Landa. And I'm gonna to try to work through, maybe condense a few of these chapters, the first three chapters, and try to come up with an overall project of what uh, de Landa is doing here and what kind of Deleuze was doing uh, you know, from a broad perspective, which is not uh, advisable actually, but let's see. Um, so the first three chapters, uh, first assemblage theory and human history. Second is materialism and politics. Third is assemblage theory and linguistic evolution. So what is assemblage theory? Assemblage theory is the way in which identities, forms, beings come into being, come into manifestation, whether they are personal identities or they are identities of cities, states, um, nationalities, whether they are identities of cups and chairs, um, essentially how do things exist in a coherent manner? And what they, what Deleuze does and Deleuze and Guattari and what Delanda obviously enforces here is they are putting forth a materialist, a materialist ontology. So how do uh, identities show up in the world without positing a transcendent uh, realm? So they go, they painstakingly go out of their way to, um, to remove any idea of transcendence, of the transcendental, of any meta narrative or any higher order um, kind of heuristic or, uh, um, or program that um, explains lower uh, the lower orders. So you can think of the idea in Aristotle of genus, species, individual. The genus is the higher level order of being that overcodes and gives meaning to the lower orders. Um, so Deleuze and Guattari understand the um, their understanding of this principle is singularity. So they have two forms of singularity, universal singularity and individual singularity. And this way they get rid of the whole idea of higher and lower. Uh, this is the root of their materialist materialist ontology. Um, and I I think that this kind of had to be the way that uh, Deleuze and Guattari were writing because they were writing within a context, uh, neo-Marxist, Freudian, um, postmodern context which the big no-no was positing any metaphysical grand narratives, any meta-narratives. Um, so they go uh, painfully out of their way to get rid of these, uh, these uh, higher level um, categories that could explain the lower. I, I, from what I see, it seems like they are just uh, folding the transcendent into the imminent. It seems like they are uh, putting forth the materialism that really makes the term matter meaningless. Um, I don't know, this is not necessarily something that probably most people would agree with me. Um, so the assemblage theory is a theory put forth in which uh, how disparate parts uh, relate to the holes that they are made out of. Uh, holes being an identity, right? So how do the parts relate to the whole and how do the whole relate to the parts where you can't reduce the parts to the whole and you can't reduce the whole to their individual parts. So the parts have individual autonomy and the whole has it in itself in its sense uh individual autonomy so um the idea that um uh like let's say a nation is made up of of citizens right so the nation has an identity the united states of america and it's made up of the individual parts the um the citizenry but not just the citizens but also the organizations uh his historical governmental um, business organizations, really at every level, they are, are identifying ways in which um, being being is organized into coherent um, holes and how the parts again relate to those holes. So assemblage theory is this way of um, not positing a transcendent realm to bring forth the identity of, of being at multiple levels of analysis. Um, biological, physical, material, material, um, technological, uh, linguistic, political, at all these levels, identity manifests in, in, a, in a way, and that's what the, the theory is kind of to speak of here. So starting out with chapter one, assemblage and human history. So how do, how do um, identities evolve or manifest in terms of human histories? Starts out with a quote from Deleuze and Guattari from the Anti-Oedipus. 
We no longer believe in a primordial totality that once existed or in a final totality that awaits us in, at some future date. We no longer believe in the dull gray outlines of a dreary, colorless dialectic of evolution aimed at forming a harmonious whole out of heterogeneous bits by rounding off their edges, their rough edges. We believe only in totalities that are peripheral. And if we discover such a totality alongside various separate parts, it is a whole of these particular parts, but does not totalize them. It is a unity of all these particular parts, but does not unify them. Rather, it is added to them as a new part fabricated separately. That's the quote. So we'll um, start in here. Delanda uh, starts the chapter. A crucial question confronting any serious attempt about thinking, thinking about human history is the nature of the historical actors that are considered legitimate in a given philosophy. One can, of course, include only human be one of course include only human beings as actors, either as rational decision makers, as in microeconomics, or as phenomenological subjects as microsociology. But if we wish to go beyond this, we need a proper conceptualization of social wholes. The very first step in this task is to devise a means to block microreductionism, a step usually achieved by the uh, concept of emergent properties properties of a whole that are not present in its parts. If a given social whole has properties that emerge from the interactions between its parts, its reduction to a mere aggregate of many rational decision makers or many phenomenological experiences is effectively blocked. But this leaves open the possibility of macroeconomics or macro reductionism, as when one rejects the rational actors of microeconomics in favor of society as a whole, a society that fully determines the nature of its members, Blocking macro-reductionism demands a second concept, the concept of relations of exteriority between parts. Unlike holes in which being part of this whole is a defining characteristic of the parts, that is, holes in which the parts cannot subsist independently of the relations they have with each other, relations of interiority, we need, a con we need to conceive of emergent holes in which the parts retain a relative autonomy so that they can be detached from one hole and plugged into another one entering into two interactions. There's a kind of general outline of the beginnings of the assemblage theory being put forth here. So with these two concepts, we can define social holes like interpersonal networks or institutional organizations that cannot be reduced to the persons that compose them and that at the same time do not reduce those persons to the whole fusing them into a totality in which their individuality is lost. Take, for example, the tightly knit communities that inhabit small towns or ethnic neighborhoods in large cities. In these communities, an important emergent property is the degree to which their members are linked together. One way of examining this property is to study networks of relations, counting the number of direct and indirect links per person, and studying their connectivity. The crucial property of these networks is their density, an emergent property that may be roughly defined by the degree to which the friends of the friends of any given member, that is his or her indirect links, know the indirect links of others, or to put it still more simply, by the degree to which everyone knows everyone else. In a dense network, word of mouth travels fast, particularly when the content of the gossip is the violation of a local norm, an unreciprocated fa favor, an unpaid bet, an unfulfilled promise. This implies the storage of personal reputations and via simple behavioral punishments like ridicule or ostracism as an, enfor an enforcement mechanism. The property of density and the capacity to store reputations and enforce norms are, are non-reducible properties and capacities of the community as a whole, but neither involves thinking of it as a seamless totality in which the member's personal identity is created by the community. A similar point applies to institutional organizations. Many organizations are characterized by the possession of an authority structure in which rights and obligations are distributed asymmetrically in a hierarchical way. But the exercise of authority must be backed by legitimacy if enforcement costs are to be kept within bounds. Legitimacy is an emergent property of the entire organization, even if it depends for its existence on personal beliefs about its source a legitimizing tradition, a set of written regulations, or even, for small organizations, the charisma of a leader. The degree to which legitimate authority is irreducible to persons can, of course, vary from case to case. In particular, the more, or, 
the more organizational resources are linked to an office or a role, as opposed to the incumbent of that role, the more irreducible legitimacy is. Nevertheless, however, centralized and despotic an organization may be, its members remain ultimately separable from it, their actual degree of autonomy depending on contingent factors about social mobility and the existence of opportunities outside the organization. So it is this type, it is this type of social hole produced by relations of exteriority, holes that do not totalize their parts that op the opening quote refers to. But that quote also mentions another important characteristic, that the holes are peripheral or exist alongside their parts. What exactly does this mean? It is not a spatial reference, as if communities or organizations existed nearby or one side of the, or existed nearby or to one side of the persons that compose them. Deleuze and Guattari may, may simply intend to say that the properties of the whole are not transcendent, existing on a supplementary dimension above its parts, but imminent. But it may also be an ontological or metaphysical remark. Communities or organizations, to stick to these examples, are as historically individuated as the persons that compose them. While it is true that the term individual has come to refer to persons or organisms in the case of animals and plants, it is perfectly coherent to speak of individual communities, individual organizations, individual cities, or individual nation states. In this extended sense, the term individual has no preferential affinity for a particular scale, persons or organisms, and refers to any entity that is singular and unique. Unlike philosophical approaches that make a strong ontological distinction between levels of existence, such as genus, species, or organism, here all, all entities must be thought of as existing at the same ontological level, differing only in scale. The human species, for example, is every bit a historical individual as the organisms that compose it. Like them, it has a date of birth the event of speciation, and at least potentiality, a, de a date of death, at least potentially, a date of death, the event of extinction. In other words, the human species as a whole exists, quote unquote, alongside the human organism and organisms that compose it. Alongside them in an ontological plane populated only by historical individuated entities. Historical, historical explanations are inevitably shaped by the ontological presuppositions of the historians who frame them. Historians may be roughly divided into two groups along lines suggested in the opening paragraph, that is, depending on which of the terms of the following binary oppositions they favor. The individual versus society, agency versus structure, choice versus order. Taking the side of the first term in these dichotomies yields narratives in which persons, typically great men, have shaped events, situations, or the outcomes of particular struggles through their ideas and action. This does not necessarily imply a disbelief in the existence of society as a whole, only a conception of it that makes it into a, an epiphenomenon. Society is a sum or aggregate of many rational agents or many phenom phenomenological experiences shaped by daily routine. Taking the side of the second terms, on the other hand, yields narratives framed in terms of the transformations that enduring social structures have undergone. The best known example of this is the sequence feudalism, capitalism, socialism. As before, there is no implication here that persons do not exist, only that they are a mere epiphenomenon. Persons are socialized as they grow up in families and attend schools, and after they have internalized the values of their societies, their obedience to traditional regulations and cultural values can be taken for granted. The late historian Fernand Braudel broke with both these traditional stances when he set out to study economic history taking as his subject society as a set of sets. The characters in his narratives include such diverse entities as communities, institutional organizations, cities, and the geographical regions formed by several interacting towns of different size. Persons are featured too, but not as great men, while larger entities like kingdoms, empires, world economies are treated not as abstract social structures, but as concrete historical entities. Speaking of sets of sets is another way of saying that the variety of forms of historical agency, communal agency, organizational agency, urban agency, imperial agency, are related to one another as parts to wholes.
Braudel is multi-scaled, is a multi-scaled social reality, which each level of scale has its own relative autonomy and hence its own history. Hence, history ceases to be constituted by a single temporal flow. The short time scale at which, which personal agency operates or the longer time scales at which social structures changes and becomes a multiplicity of flows, which each with its own variable rates of change. Braudel's vision can be enriched by replacing his sets or sets of sets with the irreducible and decomposable wholes just discussed. Let's illustrate this with a specific example one that combines Braudel's data with an ontology of individual entities constraining the field of valid historical actors. An entity such as the market, for example, would not be an acceptable entity to be incorporated into explanations of historical phenomena because it is not an individual emergent whole, but a reified generality. But the marketplaces or bazaars that have existed in every urban center since antiquity and more recently in every European town since the 11th century are indeed individual entities and can therefore figure as actors and explanations of, of the rise of Europe and of the commercial revolution that characterized the early centuries of the second millennium. Equally valid are the regional trading areas that emerged when the towns that housed local marketplaces became linked together by roads and the trade among them reached a threshold of regularity and volume. Regional markets began to play an important economic role in the Europe by, by the 14th century and as historically constituted wholes composed of local markets that started starting in England in the 18th century came into being by stitching together sometimes forcefully many provincial trading areas themselves composed of many regional markets. By the 19th century, the railroad and the telegraph made the creation of national markets a simpler task, and they emerged in places like France, Germany, and the United States, playing an important role in the economic history of these countries. Other reified generalities, like the state, should also be replaced. As argued above, in addition to communities, a set of interacting persons can give rise to institutional organizations possessing emergent properties like legitimacy. Organizations, in turn, can interact to form a larger whole, like a federal government. The latter is a whole in which many organizations are arranged in a hierarchical way with authority operating at different scales. Some have jurisdiction that extends to the entire country. Others have authority only within the boundaries of a province or state. And yet others operate within the limits of an urban center and its surrounding region. When it comes to the implementation of federal policies, this nested set of overlapping jurisdictions can be a powerful obstacle. Many policies become distorted uh, and weakened as they are implemented at different scales. This problem, however, can become invisible to historians that use the concept of the state and view governments as monolithic entities. These two examples illustrate that the distinction between micro and macro should never be made absolute, with individual persons playing the role of microentity and society as a whole the role of macro entity. Rather, micro and macro should be made relative to a particular scale. Compared to the regional trading areas that they compose, local marketplaces are micro, while regional market markets are macro. But the later, are, but the latter are micro relative to provincial markets, which are in turn micro relative to national markets. Similarly, government organizations with federal jurisdictions can be considered macro relative to those with authority extended, extending only to borders of states or provinces, and these in turn are, are macro relative to local urban authorities. Thus, both the market and the state can be eliminated from a materialist ontology by a nested set of individual emergent wholes operating at different scales. The expression operating at different scale, on the other hand, must be used carefully. In particularly, it should refer only to relative scale, that is, to scale relative to the part to whole relation. Given the fact that any emergent whole has always a larger extension than the parts of which it is composed, this relative usage is unproblematic. Communities or organizations are always larger than the persons that compose them. But the same is not true if the term scale is used in an absolute sense. If instead of comparing a community with its own members, we compare the entire population of persons and the entire population of communities inhabiting a country, for example, we would have to admit that both populations are coextensive. That is, they, that, is that they occupy the same amount of space, the entire national territory. And similarly, point, and a similar point applies to the population of institutional organizations. 
But even if we relativize the concept, we may still disagree on the use of the expression levels of scale to distinguish social wholes. Why not use, for example, the expression levels of organization, a phrase used by biologists to characterize the part to whole relationship between individual cells, individual organs, and individual organisms? Because this concept carries with it connotations of increased complexity between levels, and in some cases, even teleological implications, as when biological evolution is viewed as involving a drive to greater complexity from unicellular organisms to multicellular ones. The expression levels of scale, on the other hand, carries no such connotations. A city is clearly larger than a human being, but there is no reason to believe that it possesses a higher degree of complexity, or that any of its component parts is more complex than the human brain. One final point needs to be clarified. When we say that a set of interacting persons gives rise to a community, or that a set of interacting organizations gives rise to a federal government, this should not be taken to imply a temporal sequence, as if a set of previously disconnected persons or, um, or uh, organizations had suddenly began to interact, and a whole had abruptly sprouted into being. In a few cases, this may be indeed the case, as when people from a variety of war-stricken communities aggregate into a refugee camp and a, and a larger whole emerges from the interactions, or when previously rival industrial organizations aggregate into a cartel forming a larger whole as they interact. But in the majority of cases, the component parts come into being when a whole has already con constituted itself and has begun to use its own emergent, uh, emergent capacities to constrain and enable its parts. Most people are born into communities that predate their birth, and most new government agencies are born in the context of an already functioning central government. Nevertheless, the ontological requirement of imminence forces us to conceive of the identity of a community or of a central government as being continuously produced by the day-to-day -day interactions between its parts. The emergent properties of a social whole are imminent only to the extent that they would cease to exist if parts, if its parts cease to interact. So why need, so we need to include in a materialist ontology, not only the processes that historically produce the identity of a given social whole, but also the processes that maintain the identity through time. Let's pause for a moment to consider how compatible these ideas are with those of Deleuze and Guattari. The first sign of incompatibility is that the expression the state occurs throughout their work, but this term is often used as synonymous with state apparatus, a term that is much less objectionable since it can be taken to refer to the organizational apparatus of a given government, that is, to an emergent whole composed of many organizations. A more problematic term, one that is also often used in their historical explanations, is the term social field, or less often the socius. This term does indeed refer to society as a whole, and it is therefore not a valid historical actor in the materialist ontology being sketched here. It is unclear, for example, just what kind of entity this social field is supposed to be. Deleuze and Guattari distinguish between different kinds of social wholes, strata, and assemblages. A state, app a, state apparatus, a state apparatus is classified by them as a stratum. Tightly knit communities with their capacity to police their members and punish violations of local norms would also be a stratum. But an alliance or coalition of several heterogeneous communities would be considered to be an assemblage, as Deleuze writes, quote, What is an assemblage? It is a multiplicity which is made up of heterogeneous terms and which establishes liaisons, relations between them, cross ages, sexes, and reigns different natures. Thus, the assemblage's only un unity is that of a co-functioning. It is a symbiosis, a sympathy. It is, neither f it is neither filiations, which are important, but alliances, alloys. These are not successions, lines of descent, but contagions, epidemics, the wind, end quote. So we face the problem of whether to treat the social field as a stratum or an assemblage. A different but related problem is that distinguishing between different kinds of holes, strata in general, assemblages in general, may open the, the back door for reified generalities to infiltrate a materialist ontology. It's a big no-no. To avoid this danger, we can use a single term and build it into and build into it control knobs, or more technically, parameters. So this is the device used to ensure that we don't um, create the uh, or commit the sin of reified generalities, parameters. 
that can have different settings at different times. For some settings, the social whole would be a stratum. For other settings, an assemblage. So again, a stratum is a coherent, unified whole, right? An assemblage is a less unified, made of more disparate parts. So you can think of a stratum like the um, uh, United States in the 1950s. Um, they're going to bring in some other terms in here, territorialization and deterritorialization, um, as well as uh, coding and decoding. Um, so you can think of using this analogy of the United States in the 50s as a coherent strata since it has been deterritorialized, as there have been a lot of forces that are disintegrating this coherent whole. And um, especially now here in 2020, we see this as intensifying. But anyways, back to parameters here. The term parameter comes from scientific models of physical processes, whereas variables specify the different ways in which an object being studied is free to change its degrees of freedom. Parameters specify in the environmental factors that affect the object. Temperature can be a variable, the internal temperature of a body of water, for example, as well as a parameter quantifying the degree of temperature of the water's surroundings. Parameters are normally kept constant in the laboratory to study an object under repeatable circumstances, but they may have also be very they may also be varied, causing drastic changes in the object under study. While for many values of a parameter, like temperature, only a quantitative change will be produced. At critical points, a body of water will spontaneously change qualitatively, abruptly transforming from a liquid to a solid form or a, or from a liquid to a gas form. So an interesting question to ask is um, where do the capacities where is the capacity for water to change from liquid to uh, solid to gas where do they exist um, when you are thinking of a glass of water you have a glass of water it's liquid water where does the capacity for that water to become either solid or or gas exist when it's just water anyways that's an aside so if you parameterize a single concept then strata and assemblages would cease to be kinds and become phases, like the solid and fluid phases of matter. Unlike mutually exclusive binary categories, phases can be transformed into one another and even coexist as mixtures, like a gel that is a mixture of the solid and liquid phases of different materials. Deleuze and Guattari routinely establish oppositions between kinds, trees and rhizomes, striated and smooth space, only to backtrack later as they discuss the ways in which one kind can be transferred into the other or form hybrid mixtures. Thus, the strategy I will follow here will be to keep a single term, the term assemblage, and parameterize it to allow it to exhibit qualitatively uh, different phases. While we could, of course, parameterize the term stratum, the first choice is better because the original French term agencement has quite distinct connotations. Thus, we can use the, the English term assemblage to denote the, the parameterized concept and revert to the French term whenever we need to refer to the original concept. Before discussing the nature of the parameters, let's summarize what has been said about assemblages so far. One, all assemblages have a fully contingent historical identity, and each of them is therefore an individual entity. An individual person, an individual community, an individual organization, an individual city. Because the ontological status of all assemblages is the same, entities operating at different scales can directly interact with one another, individual to individual, a possibility that does not exist in a hierarchical ontology, like that composed of genera, species, and individuals. Two, at any level of scale, we are always dealing with populations of interacting entities, populations of persons, pluralists of communities, multiplicities of organizations, collectivities of urban centers. And it is from the interactions within these populations that larger assemblages emerge as statistical result or as a collective unintended consequences of, of intentional action. In a given population, some entities may get caught into larger, larger molar holes, while other may remain fee, free, composing a molecular collectivity. This means that a whole at a given scale is composed not only of molar entities at, an, at, at the immediately lower scale, but also of smaller molecular parts. So he is introducing two more uh, common concepts found through Deleuze and Guattari is the molar and the molecular. Third, once a larger scale assemblage is in place, it immediately starts acting as a source of limitations and resources for its components. 
In other words, even though the arrow of causality in this scheme is bottom-up, it also has a top-down aspect. An assemblage both constrains and enables its parts. The upward causality is necessary to make emergent properties imminent. An assemblage's properties may be irreducible to its parts, but that does not make them transcendent, since they would cease to exist if the parts stopped interacting with one another. The downward causality is indeed to account is needed to account for the fact that most social assemblages are composed of parts that come into existence after the whole has emerged. Most of the buildings or neighborhoods that compose a modern city, for example, were not only created after the urban, uh, urban center's own birth, but their defining properties were constrained by the city's zoning laws and their creation made possible by the city's wealth. So I'm going to just conclude here with the uh, introduction of the concepts of territorialization, deterritorialization, and degree of coding and decoding. And then we'll, we'll be done here. So let's now parameterize the concept of assemblage. The first parameter quantifies the degree of territorialization and deterritorialization of an assemblage. Territorialization refers not only to the determination of the spatial boundaries of a whole, as in the territory of a community, city, or nation state, but also to the degree to which an assemblage's component parts are drawn from a heterogeneous repertoire, or the degree to which an assemblage homogenizes its own components. As mentioned before, the members of a densely connected community are constrained by the capacity of the community to store reputations and enforce local norms, a constraint that may result in a reduction of personal differences and in an increased degree of conformity. When two or more communities engage in ethnic or religious conflict, for example, not only the geographical boundaries of their neighborhoods or small towns will be policed, uh, uh, policed more intensely, so will have behavior of their members as the distinction. No, I'm sorry. Here. When two or more communities engage in ethnic or religious conflict, for example, not only the geographical boundaries of their neighborhoods or small towns will be policed more intensely, so will the behavior of their members as the distinction between us and them sharpens. Any small deviation from the local norms will now be observed and punished and the homogenization of behavior will increase. Conflict, in other words, tends to decrease the degree of territorialization of communities, a fact that may be captured conceptually by, a changing, by changing the settings of this parameter. The second parameter quantifies the assemblage's degree of coding and decoding. Coding refers to the role played by language in fixing the identity of a social whole. In institutional organizations, for example, the, legit the legitimacy of an authority structure is in most cases related to linguistically coded rituals and regulations. In organizations in which authority is based on tradition, these will tend to be legitimized narratives contained in some sacred text, while in those governed by a rational legal form of authority, there will be written rules, standard procedures, and most importantly, a constitutional charter defining its rights and obligations. While all individual organizations are coded in this sense, a state apparatus performs coding operations that affect an entire territory and all the communities and organizations that inhabit it. The more despotic or totalitarian a, uh, a state apparatus, the more everything becomes coded. Dress, food, manners, property, trade, etc. Because many archaic states allowed the communities over which they ruled to keep their own social codes superimposing on them dominant code, Deleuze and Guattari refer to this operation as overcoding. So you can think of the idea of an assemblage's degree of coding and decoding in the idea of um, an overcoded or a highly coded assemblage or state would be one that is fascist, where all the buildings are uniform, all of the, um, all of the dress is uniform, this uniformity, this kind of hyper-coherence um, is, is one parameter um, that are, is being discussed here. Uh, you could also see how a decoding would be the destruction of that fascist state, a splintering of its different communities. Um, this would be, a sense, decoding or the process of deterritorializing the assemblage. Um, so just some, some food for thought here. All right, I'm going to stop there. Um, and um, let me know if you've got this far, um, you know, if you're interested in hearing more in this, um, this kind of line of thinking here. Thanks for listening.